Welcome to the underground. Turn me up, bitch! My Little Underground with Peter A. It's My Little Underground. I'm Peter A. Make sure you're subscribed anywhere you get podcasts. On Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. I don't care where you listen as long as you're listening. Make sure you follow the show as well at MLUPod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can follow me as well at it's Peter underscore A on Instagram and Twitter. Today we got Long Island DJ DJ Caution on the show to talk all things DJing, how we got started, how we first got paid for it, CDJs versus turntables, and his brand new Twitch show that he started in the wake of all of his gigs getting canceled due to COVID. And he's been a long supporter of My Little Underground. Truly appreciate DJ Caution, and he's right here on My Little Underground. All right, DJ Caution, what's up, brother? How you doing? Doing all right, man. How about yourself? Pretty good, pretty good, man. How you doing um, isolated during these current hey, times? Hey, man, I'm just uh, just hanging in there like uh, like everybody else, just uh, trying to make the best of it and just get through it, you know? Yeah, I mean, you've been getting through it. And probably, you know, the best way possible being creative with uh, your Twitch show, which we'll talk about. But the one thing that you, you've said on your Twitch show that you DJed for Mace. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I said I said that last night. Um, yeah, that was a show um, with the uh, with my homie uh, Smooth City. Um, it's actually Ashanti's tour DJ. Big ups to him. He's the man. Um, we needed last minute coverage at. Uh, Emporium in Patchogue, now called Stereo Garden. And he was like, yo, can you just like DJ this one? Like, I think it was like a Thursday night or something. Can you do this Thursday night with me? And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, I work, to, I work with you all the time. And I was like, where are we? He's like, we're at Emporium. Okay. And then I was like, okay, yeah, lock me in. This is what we're getting paid. All right, cool, great. And then that was the conversation. And then I just happened to look and I go, oh, I wonder if it's like a special occasion, if it's like a theme night or something. So I just hopped on Emporium's instagram page it was like this thursday mace <laughs> i was just like wait a minute yo are we are, are we dj for mace he's like oh yeah, yeah i forgot to tell you that i was like yeah you might want to tell me that dude like <laughs> hall and world was like the first album i ever bought with my own money <laughs> like, come on man this was that how long ago was this Ooh, um i mean this has to be it's got to be like five five maybe six years ago at this point yeah that, that probably that probably sounds about right but yeah, it was it, it was it was a few it was a few years ago. It was I mean I guess recent Mace. It definitely wasn't uh, you know still signed to Bad Boy wearing the shiny suits Mace. <laughs> but uh, but it, but it, well, it, it welcome was, back man. Mace. It wasn't God. It wasn't even that. <laughs> no offense to him. He probably definitely still has more money than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it was a it was a fun show. That was my first experience with uh, with DJing for you know like some you know somewhat of a major artist and. Uh, and it, and it was cool. I only ended up doing, you know, I opened, I opened for him. I did the whole, you know, did the opening of the club. Um, and then I think I, like, did, like, his intro or something like that. And then, like, halfway through, like, because what ended up happening was his DJ ended up having some, some technical issues, which was definitely the case of, like, he just got, like, his friend that thought he knew how to plug a computer in to be his tour DJ. And this dude was, like, crumbling over, like, how to set something up. So as I'm playing, literally playing his intro and kind of extending it and Smooth City's hyping up on the mic, like we're literally stalling, like as the club is full and I'm trying to, because this is back, this is the days when almost every club and everything, you know, we were still using Serato boxes. The stuff wasn't, stuff was, some stuff was built into the mixer, but a lot of times, especially during switchovers, you were using the, 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 uh, the Serato boxes and this dude didn't know how to switch over. And it was just me literally looping stuff while grabbing his USB from him, plugging it in, hitting the dip switches in the back. Like it was, uh, it was a little stressful, but it, it ended up being a lot of fun. Wow, that that's very uh, adventurous. And you, you know what's interesting? Like I've noticed over the last decade or so, a lot of like um, relics from hip hop's past end up playing these very underpromoted, almost secret shows. East on Eastern Long Island, like I remember a friend of mine told me that Ludacris played at Stony Brook, 
uh, yes. in like 2012, which was crazy. Yep, I was Did you there. go to that show? Were you there? Yep, I was. I was in. A, I was in. A, I was in attendance, but I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't. You know, like on the event or anything like that. Um, the thing with the Stony Brook shows, dude, I've seen a lot of great people at Stony Brook. I've seen Nas at Stony Brook. I've seen Fabulous. Um, I've seen Matt and Kim, which was one of the funnest. I've seen them multiple times, but like to see Matt and Kim play in the like the practice gym of Stony Brook University was hysterical. Um, I saw Wale there, like um, like uh, what was his first album? Uh, Attention Deficit, I think it was his first. Like that, like that era Wale, Nike boots, and like the song with Lady Gaga and uh, Wale, which was crazy. That was that was a great show too. Um, yeah, it was Stony Brook, because they, they only really promote it, because it, it's usually one of the Brook Fests, and they kind of only really promote it to the students, and students, faculty, and, like, the immediate residents. Like, you know, if you if you live in Stony Brook or the Three Village area, you'll probably end up hearing about that show. But, uh, yeah, man, I'm sure they're still happening. I'm sure they're still getting good shows over there. But, uh, I mean, obviously not now, but over the past few years, I'm sure they're still doing great shows there. But, yeah, Stony Brook shows were the best, even though I did get kicked out of the fabulous one. What? what? Why? What happened? Um, I went with um, a few friends of mine who enjoyed, you know, smoking weed here, here and there. And it was one of those cases of like, I just happened to be next to them while they were because, you know, I was I was the nerd that that, that wasn't partaking. And, uh, you know, they kind of just like they would get kicked out. And of course, one of them had to look at me and go, Salvetti, we're out of here. And then all of a sudden, the security's like, oh, you're with them too? And I was like, oh, I guess I'm out of here too. So we got, we got kicked out like halfway through Fabulous' set. It, that's like the opposite of like Irving Plaza. Because when I went to go see Immortal Technique there, there was weed smoke everywhere. And I wasn't used to it at the time. And it was just so overwhelming to me. So, yeah. wow. <laughs> Irving, Unbelievable. Irving, Irving Plaza is hands down one of my favorite places to see a show. It's just the right size. like, And you could see just... They, they get dope, you know, you can, you know, they sometimes they'll get their big people. You know, I think Foo Fighters did like a random show there a few years ago. I think Metallica did a few, sh- uh, did a show there a few years ago. But like, that's where you go. Like, the last time I went there, I think I saw Aesop Rock. Not Aesop Rocky people, Aesop Rock, big difference. And, uh, huge and that, difference. I, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, lo- I, I love both of them though. But, uh, yeah, huge. just, just creatively, they're just, yeah. you know, extremely different. That's what, what I mean. Great show. Yeah. What a great show. Yeah. I've seen Wu-Tang there. I've seen multiple punk rock bands there. I think I've seen like, God, I'm pretty sure I've seen like Madball there. Like it's just that that's just a great that's a great place where it's just like, you know, what I have a random Tuesday off. What's going on at Irving Plaza? Oh, this band that I remotely know or I love is playing there um, and the tickets are dumb cheap. All right, we're going. You know, it's 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 a that's that's definitely one of my favorites. So how long have you been DJing? Um, I've been DJing, I, I mean, I guess in the sense of like, I got my first setup and started messing around, I guess it's gotta be about 15 years. Yeah. I guess it's gotta be 15 years. I got my first setup when I was, uh, 13, like kind of like just about to turn 14. Um, and you know, then it was, you know, the digital thing kind of just came out. Um, a lot of guys still weren't messing with it or at least not taking it out to gigs yet. And, you know, it was still, you had to choose. It, I wasn't I wasn't starting when it was just vinyl. You kind of had to choose. Did you want to go the vinyl route or did you want to go the CD route? Because also at that time, the whole CDJ thing was really catching um, big momentum. The CDJ 1000 was kind of becoming the, the industry standard. But I was just such a fan of the guys on turntables that I was like, all right, I want, I want to go that route. So, you know, at 13, uh, my dad <laughs> took me to canal street and we bought a pair of, you know, a very, you know, unbelievably basic, um, DJ set up in some basement. It's some place in, uh, in canal street. And that's, uh, that's kind of where it started. Did you have a, a controller or did you have turntables? What was yeah, it was, like? I had it was a pair of Stanton turntables, um, which you know the, Stanton's been around forever, and they do make, especially now, like a, a lot of people are using their higher end turntables now. But at that time, like I was, it was the budget turntable. Like 
anything lower than this turntable, and it would have been a, I, it would have been like a belt drive turntable. Like it was, but you know, also getting into DJing is a is an expensive thing. So you know, you you don't want to buy the top of the line, spend seven grand at the at, in your first shot because who knows if you're actually going to like it. But you want to get something that's good enough to where you can get a good taste of it. So we got budget turntables. Um, then I had a Newmark mixer. I think it was called like the D the DX three thousand or something like that. It was a three channel um, beige and purple mixer. Um, I didn't know if it was good at the time or anything. Um, it ended up being good. It, it's funny because the mixer was totally not meant for scratching and. Um, which is funny because you look at my style now and there's definitely a decent amount of scratching. There's definitely guys that scratch way more than I do, but uh, I definitely accent a lot of mixes with scratching. So um, learning to scratch on that because the crossfader was just, even at its tightest setting, um, it still wasn't that tight for like really getting into it as far as your cuts. So I remember back in the day, I used to have to take uh, painter's tape and I would tape off like where the real cutoff point was for that mixer and kind of make the gap smaller. A lot of people, you know, all the older heads, if they're listening right now, they've definitely done that. But uh, yeah, I rode that out until I was probably 17. I rode that setup out. And then from there, I switched to a Vestex mixer, the thin PMC-05, which I still have in my parents' attic. I got I to gotta break that out. I got to head over there and get that out of the attic one day. Um, that's just a classic turntablist mixer. Um, great crossfader, but it was also very bare bones, like as far as the EQ and the sound quality. So like it, I still wasn't there as far as like getting the right mixer um, for, you know, the right mixer for what I'm doing now. And, um, but th I really learned how to scratch, scratch on that. And then when I was 18, I got my first pair of techniques and uh, they're actually, my first pair of techniques are in front of me right now. I'm still, you know, anyone who knows techniques knows that they will last forever. <laughs> um, if you, if you treat them right, you know, they'll, they'll damn near outlive me at this point. <laughs> like they're, uh, so I'm still, I'm still using that. Um, I do, I do also own a pair of CDJ 2000s now. Um, I love them. Uh, I, I know a lot of guys out there that are still like, you know, nothing's like the turntable, which they are 1000% right. However, you know, getting a little older, sometimes you don't want to carry a, like a coffin full of, you know, with two Technique 1200s and a, and a nice size mixer. Those CDJs damn near half the weight. So it's, you know, it's definitely pretty good. You know, I'm getting a little older and my back's not what it was. So I, I definitely enjoy them too. <laughs> So when you're 13, 14 years old, going to Canal Street with your pops, when did you realize that I want to be a DJ or I want to just try it out? Was it your love of hip hop music or listening to Gangstar, was, Premier Scratch? Or what, was, what was it? It was definitely a combination of a few things. Um, when, and I feel like a lot of people had this, I had an older cousin who was just like, and to this day, I still think he's just the coolest dude ever. But you know, when you're, when you're 13, he's 16. And he's doing all this cool stuff. You're like, I want to be like that dude. So he started, um, he started DJing and kind of getting into the rave scene. Um, a lot of like drum and bass and jungle and house music and stuff like that. So I would, and he lived pretty close to me at the time. And I would go hang out with him and he would just be playing all these records and stuff like that. And I loved that. And he was into hip hop. So, you know, I got into you know, it was long before, it was long after, I should say, the albums were released. But, you know, I got into my De La Souls, my tribe, and Rock Him, and the stuff like that. So I was kind of just getting absorbed in music. And then on top of that, my dad, being a musician um, and just being a big music head, he was, you know, music, I was just constantly always listening to it, whether it was Wu Tang or whether it was Rancid or Slayer or like anything, you know. So I was always listening to music a lot. And then seeing someone mess around with music was, I was like, oh, that's the coolest thing ever. And then from there, um, I started to hear real DJ mixes and see footage of DJing. I think the first footage I ever saw, um, and this might sound corny, but I'm sure a lot of people started because of this movie. The first thing I really saw of like real DJing was the movie Beat Street. And my dad was a big fan of that, of that movie. And up until that point, I thought, you know, I was already messing around on my cousin's setup. And 
I thought, you know, if you're a DJ, you kind of only stay in one lane. You're a drum and bass DJ or you're a house DJ, you know, whatever. And then he showed me that movie and you saw Double K on that, on that, uh, on that movie. He's mixing drum breaks from Led Zeppelin to like a conga drum and, you know, a synthesizer from this, from Kraftwerk or something like that. And it's like, no, there's really, if it sounds good together, that's what you mix together. And if it, and it, you know, that's where you go with it. So I was getting into it with that. And I was like, okay, I think I want to be a DJ. Then I heard DJ Z trips and DJ P's mix uneasy listening. And that was hands down to this day. Like I, I listen to that and I get chills. Those dudes were blending incredible bongo band with Metallica and then going and, you know, mixing like Pat Benatar with far side. And it was like, Oh my God, like there's really, you can, you really can be extremely creative with this thing. It's not just playing a song you like. Um, so up to that point, it, I was, I was really hooked and just bought as much vinyl as I could, you know, whether I really used it or not, I just wanted to have it so I could at least listen to it. And it's kind of just, you know, stayed like that for 15 years. Now, nowadays, like young people can go on YouTube and watch tutorials on on how to DJ. You know, you being so young, like how did you kind of learn how to do it? Did you watch other people or just watching, you know, um, watching movies or or what? Like what, what was it? Oh, yeah. There was definitely, um, well, there was definitely, it definitely wasn't today where you can just hop on to YouTube and go to like the Beat Junkies online school and like learn exact stuff, which is amazing. Big shout out to them. Those guys are doing God's work with that stuff. But, um, you know, there was some stuff floating around. Um, getting back to DJ Z Trip, he, there was a big documentary that came out in, I want to say 2000, maybe 2001. Um, I might be totally off. I suck with dates. But anyway, early 2000s. We'll go with that. And uh, it was the, the documentary Scratch. And if you are remotely interested in getting into DJing, I recommend you watch that documentary because... Very good. I love yeah, it. Man, yeah, man. You get... First off, you get you get a history, a little bit of a history lesson, at least in the hip-hop world of DJing and in a little bit of, of the, the electronic world. But... You know, you really know where this stuff comes from, and to yeah, you just watch that, watch that. But there was a bonus feature of it um, where it was called "How to Rock a Party with DJ Z Trip," and it was a little tutorial, uh, maybe 30, 40 minutes. And I was already like, from the documentary and hearing his mixes and stuff, I was a big fan of Z Trip. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna watch this. And he kind of just broke down, you know, the certain techniques, you know, mixing records going from one to the other and then blending records you know here's an acapella and here's an instrumental um you know he touched he touched on scratching and when he touched on scratching it really it really stuck with me because he emphasized that when you're party rocking when you know when you're playing for people you don't want to just go up there put on an instrumental and just go through every single scratch you know and just start you know pretty much drilling it into the audience's head because you're just going to crap on the song um, and you're just going to crap on the vibe. That's, that's showcase stuff. And so when he was demonstrating it, he was mixing a song in and then, you know, add a little eight, 16 bar at most, scratch in and out with it. And, you know, to this day, I run that style into the ground. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's me right there. Um, so there was that. Uh, there was... You know, then there was just a lot of just being a nerd and just getting my hands on as many mixes as I could. Um, you know, we had a local radio station out here that was doing a lot of DJ mixes, and I was listening to them and just like, all right, how are they doing that? Okay, I think that guy just took the bass out of this song. He's adding it to that. And it, was, it really was just a flat-out obsession, whether it was learning how to mix, learning how to scratch, and just taking bits and pieces from absolutely everything that I could get my hands on, you know, even, even the more advanced stuff. Like, you know, I, I grew up watching DMC videos too. I, I definitely wouldn't consider myself a technical turntablist. You know, I'm not a battle DJ, but you know, watching guys like craze and a track, you know, who are still two of the greatest of all time in my, in my opinion, and the executioners and stuff like that, it was to watch how they would manipulate 
songs and just take a record and just go totally left with it and take you on this ride. Um, that was that was huge for me. And then the house music guys too. You know, guys like Carl Cox and Roger Sanchez who were taking three or four records and and layering them on top of each other. That was that was big for me too. It really just honestly, man, it just came down to I became obsessed and still am. And that's that's how I learned everything. Just you know, trying to soak absolutely everything in. You know, with all the DJs I've I've heard you know talk about you know the kind of hardware they use. You know, there's always a conversation, CDJs versus turntables. So what about CDJs that more traditional DJs are like, eh, I don't know. And, you know, what do people love about using turntables and not using CDJs? Is it the history or what is it? Um, well, it's probably a few things. I mean, definitely like the the guys older than me, the, the, older, the older heads that are still really flying the flag for turntables – um, I think it's definitely a comfort thing, you know, it's a, and for me, it's, for me, it's a comfort thing too. You know, I, I've, I've rolled up into venues and they've given me the choice. Do you want to use turntables or do you want to use CDJs tonight? And if, and I'm always going to say, if you give, if they give me the choice, I'm going to say turntables. Um, if the venue has an easy load in and I have to bring my own gear, I'll probably bring the turntables out. Um, it's just a, a really big comfort thing because it's such a big piece of gear. You know, you could you get your whole hand on on the on the record and and manipulate the way it is. Um, and especially now, you know, where almost all of us are on some type of digital platform, whether it's Serato, whether it's Tractor, or you know, whatever. And so we don't have to bring the records out anymore, but we can still maintain this classic feel that we're used to. So there, there's def there's definitely that. Um, and they kind of view it as, and I sort of get this. Um, I used to really get it. Like I was, dude, I was one of those guys back in the days. If I saw you on anything other than turntables, I just, I wasn't, I like wasn't a fan. Um, and then I saw like a lot of the house guys really using them. And I was like, oh, this, they're doing, you know, they're pushing that piece of equipment to, the next level you know it's you can do what you can do on a turntable on a cdj and you know it really just comes down to guys like oh these people aren't keeping it real and these uh these young kids don't know what it's like to you know dig and you know have to deal with the hardships of of vinyl which is true and i think it does make you a better dj if you do get your hands on some turntables and really you know feel what it's like to have an analog source where if you just leave it alone you know, if you're mixing, but you don't constantly nudge or pull back, your tracks are going to go out of sync. With CDJs, you hit play and you time and you lock that pitch in. Take your hands off. That it's going to stay like that forever. Um, especially now with the, you know with uh, the CDJs being so amazing. But you know, I think it's I think it's a tired argument. I think we've reached a point now where you know DJ with what you want to DJ on, and if it's comfortable for you. You know, it's, you know, you, that's what you do, you know, and it's, it's like a guitar player, like being comfortable on a Gibson um, and he, they're an amazing guitar player and they're super comfortable on a Gibson, but they get thrown into a situation where they have to use something else. They're still going to kill it just in the back of the head. They're probably just gonna be like, man, I really wish I was playing on a Gibson, you know, like <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of what it is. So now, nowadays, man, I've, I've DJed on controllers. DJ on CDJs. I own a pair of CDJs, and you know when I can, I I use my turntables as as often as I can. So when you're as you're getting older and you're getting more comfortable with DJing, when did you first start to get paid to DJ? Oh man, um, I think my first paying gig, which I definitely didn't get paid any more than a hundred bucks, was a backyard party with my cousin who I talked about earlier. Um, I want to say I was, eesh, I want to say I was 17, maybe. Um, and uh, we were playing just, you know, just rave stuff, you know, drum, drum and bass and, um, and, and house, you know, hard style was kind of picking up uh, steam 
I wasn't a big fan of it, but he was. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we were playing all that in this backyard crowd, and it was, like, looking back on it now, I was like, dude, like, I was way too young to be <laughs> to be in that situation. And how I was allowed to go and DJ this thing was unbelievable. You know, people were, you know, just think of, you know, rave stuff. You know, there were some shenanigans going on in a backyard with, with pretty much no adult supervision. Not that you needed adult supervision. Most of the people there were already in their <laughs> mid twenties, and uh, you know it was it it, w- it was interesting because I was just I didn't know, you know I didn't know anything about reading a crowd at that point, and I was just kind of just flying by the seat of my pants. And at the end of the night, I think I was paid like fifty bucks or something like that, and you know, and I was like, oh cool, I guess I there's a way to make money off of this thing. And then from there, um, just doing as many gigs as as I possibly could you know a, a lot of times you know especially my early especially in my late teens early 20s I was taking gigs where I didn't even know if I was going to get paid you know it was like a surprise at the end of the night you know like oh man I got I got 110 bucks this night this is crazy wow I'm a superstar watch out freaking a track I'm coming for you but uh you know and it's and then it just slowly and slowly kept building up and then I reached a point where I started to get into the the private event world, you know, the mobile event world, which a lot of guys might look down on, but you know, I think I think you could be just as creative in that world as you can in the nightlife world. And uh, you know, started making money doing that, started gaining momentum, building relationships with promoters and other DJs and you know, just kept just kept going and now I reached a point where, you know, it's pretty much my full-time job. So when you're, you know, out there, do you, like, especially if someone wants to start getting paid for it, like, especially on Long Island, backyard parties, sweet 16s, weddings, that's kind of where you start, right? Um, yeah, I would say so. I think, I, I feel like guys might hold off on getting into the wedding realm. Um, one, because they feel like they don't want to, they feel like it's, you know, almost like selling out because a lot of times when people start DJing, that's not their end game to get into the private event world. You know, they, they want to be they want to be a superstar, you know, um, either on like a DMC stage or on like a festival stage or something. But, um, you know, so they don't really that usually that goal doesn't really come into focus until you're actually in it. And you're like, oh, you know what? Maybe I should do a wedding. And there's still a lot of guys out there. There's guys out there that kill it in nightlife that are terrified of DJing weddings. I think they're one of the easiest things on earth as long as you know what songs to play at the right time. But, uh, you know, a lot of times, yeah, man, guys are starting out. They're starting out maybe opening for another DJ for next to no money um, or DJing just some crappy dive bars like I was. I had a great time, Adam, but let's be real. They were crappy. But, uh yeah, just backyard parties, every family function that I could just bring my turntables to. And I still, to this day, don't know if they even liked it when I did that. But God damn it, they dealt with it. So they're the best. So that was, you know, that's how I got started. I just DJed absolutely everything I could get to come my way. Whether, it was, you know, I DJ punk rock shows. I DJ hardcore shows, hip hop shows, local rappers, just absolutely everything. Because there's no way you're going to leave a gig with absolutely no experience or no lesson from it you know what i mean like even if even if it's a negative thing you know okay i I won't do that again or oh i should have hooked this up that way or let's not deal with people like that again you know that's so that's that's stuff especially to to someone starting out just dj absolutely everything you can and wait a little while before you get selective over over what you're djing yeah you gotta put the weed in the bag you gotta start somewhere yeah absolutely and also you know you might you might learn some music that you don't necessarily um, didn't know you liked, I guess you could say. I was, I, I got hired to do a show out in Bethpage one time, and it was classified to me as a rock show. And I was like, okay. And at that time in my head, I was like, okay, you know, just the term rock. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to be playing like ACDC or Def Leppard and, you know, whatever. And then I go in there, and it's a straight up hardcore show. And I was just like, oh, crap like what is you know i i knew what the genre was you know i knew who like i i knew who madball and like you know snapcase were but besides that i was i i went into this blind i was like oh crap like i 
and that was a situation where I didn't have the right music. I was able to get away with it and just go punk rock after that because um, I was already familiar with that. But from there, I was like, I was like, wow, like I was caught off guard. But also, I really like this music. Um, so from there, I got into, I, you know, that helped me get into hardcore music. Um, I've gone from, you know, did did a show where I opened up for for the DJ and when he got on, he ended up playing a good amount of disco stuff that I didn't know about. You know, at that point, I only knew really the obvious ones, you know, your Earth, Wind, and Fires and stuff like that. So there's always something to be learned at the gigs. Even, like I said, even if, you know, you walk out of that gig, man, man, that, that, that kind of sucked, but I got this out of it. I think it's, I think it's fair to say, like, to be, successful as a dj you kind of have to be like a music fan first and foremost and be open to different types of music like you were saying oh yeah because if you're not you're going to be miserable in this game like it's you know tr i mean trust me there's plenty of times where i have had to play stuff where i'm not that big of a fan of it um but you know if you're not into this with an open mind like i and i just want to soak in everything i could you know, unless you're just trying to be some EDM superstar that just plays 128 BPM for two hours a night, you, you know, unless you're trying to do that, if you're trying to be a real working DJ, you're going to be miserable if you're not just like a, a fan of music and you're not going to last long. So when did you first realize that, huh, I can make regular money off of this, not just 50 bucks, 100 bucks here, or maybe a hot dog, like you're an indie wrestler or something like that. <laughs> hot, dog and a hot dog and a handshake, brother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I probably realized that, um, well, I definitely realized it the first wedding that I did, um, when I walked out of there with like a few hundred bucks, and, and I was like, oh, and and that was that was a big wake up call. And I hear nightmare stories of guys' first weddings being uh, just nightmares. But that was, you know, I, I look back on it and I, I think that went really well. So for that, I was like, okay, there's, there's some serious money to be made in, in that world. And then in the nightlife world, um, I kind of realized that when I was at a local, uh, a local spot in, uh, in Farmingville, a hookah lounge, and I sort of knew the DJ. You know, we were kind of like acquaintances. And it was a slow night, and I was, he was kind of like letting me get on, on on the DJ setup, and there was like maybe five people in there. It was like, it was like two in the morning on like a Tuesday, like who the hell's going to be there? So we just kind of started a scratch session. I started doing that, getting down with him on that, and the manager comes up, and he's like, hey, you know, we actually need someone to fill in next week. You know, how much, how much do you charge? And in my head, I was, I was like, I, I didn't know what to charge. So I didn't think I would get as much for the wedding like or a private party at that point. But I was like, I'm just going to say that number because it came to, to my head. So I told him, and he, was, and he was like, okay. And I was like, oh, oh man, like I, could, I could make that money doing this stuff too. I thought, I thought these DJs didn't make anything. So from there, that's when I, when I discovered that. And... You know, I really just made it a point to just make as many relationships as I can, have a good attitude for it, and just pick up as many gigs as I can. You know, it, it definitely, you know, it definitely took a long time to get to where I'm at now, where you know I can DJ four times a week and make pretty, pretty damn good money. Um, you know, de I'm definitely not rich, but you know, it's it's a it's a career at this point. You know, so but it really just yeah. So I just started getting booked and the more I got booked the more I realized like huh maybe I maybe I don't have to wait tables maybe I can just do this stuff <laughs> when do you, when does one like figure out their price or how much they can charge you know what I'm saying uh, that's dude I I still have moments where I don't know um what I should really charge people but that really comes from you know you kind of figure out for me at least, I just tried to figure out what other people were making, and it wasn't, like I wouldn't, you don't wanna just go up to someone and be like, hey man, how much do you make during this? But um, you kinda like figure out a way to like get a good idea, and then 
once I realize where I'm like, I think I'm on the level of so and so, and I think, and I know he's getting paid around this ballpark. Let me see if I could get paid in that ballpark. And you know, sometimes you'll get shot down. Sometimes they'll offer you a hundred dollars less. Sometimes they'll just say okay. And it's really, you know, just a matter of, you know, I think I'm worth. I think I'm worth this. I know there's a good amount of guys that are already getting this. You know, let's let's shoot for that. Um, and it just and little by little, the number just got a little higher, a little higher, a little higher. And you know, it's just it's just a lot of baby steps. You know, I. I I really can't think of any DJ that all of a sudden one day woke up and real and said to themselves, "I'm worth a thousand dollars a night, and that's what I'm going to charge people, and that's what I'm going to get." You know, it's uh, it definitely isn't that. Maybe there's a handful of people where that happened, but even when you realize that you're worth this amount of money, it's a bit of a struggle to get to that. You know, because especially out here in Long Island, where just every manager and owner is trying to stretch every penny that they that they can. It's 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 definitely hard to find a good paying nightlife spot at least. But uh yeah, it's just it's just baby steps of just seeing where you fit in the world of this DJ game and just trying to get to that goal and then when you get to that goal go, okay, well I gotta figure out a way to make my price go up a little bit more and then, you know, just keep just keep pushing at it. It's definitely a long a long battle though of getting of getting to actually getting paid what you think you're actually worth. So bring me inside the the Long Island DJ scene. You know, what kind of gigs are you typically getting? Um, I mean, for the, I'm kind of, I'm one of the guys that's half and half. Uh, I've, I definitely split my time between the private event slash mobile world. And I work in the event production of that world as well during the week, which is another, uh, you know, I, I find that so much fun. But so I'm splitting my time between being at a catering hall or a private event venue doing a wedding, you know, bar mitzvah, corporate event, stuff like that. I'm splitting my time between that. And then besides that, it's, it's nightlife, which is, it, which has definitely changed a lot throughout the last few years, especially in Suffolk County where, where, I'm, where most of my nightlife gigs are. The concept of a nightclub really doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the, the whole thing of, you know, going to a spot where, you know, you could get a table and get bottle service and stuff like that, that really only exists out east, you know, in the Hamptons and beyond. But even then, it's not as popular as, as it used to be. So now it's kind of shifted to people don't want to go to clubs. And I have my theories on why, on why that happened. People don't really want to go to clubs anymore. So what they really want is a bar with a, with a nice sized dance floor or just an area where you can dance. And that's, that's really what, it, what it's morphed into. Um, just people picking a main street and that main street will have, you know, 10 or maybe even more bars on it. And they're going to bounce around. A good amount of them are not going to charge a cover and they're going to go in there. And if they like it, they, they might stay. If, and if they're getting burnt out on it, they're going to move on to the next one. And that's pretty much, uh, you know, at least, at least in Suffolk, and I would say most of Nassau, at least too, um, that's what the nightlife world has become, which has its good, you know, which has its positives and has its negatives, in my opinion. But all in all, you know, I, I, I still enjoy it. Why do you think people are going to clubs as, they, as you described? I think they got burnt out on the, on the nightclub format. Um, and that's a whole nother can of worms. But in, you know, for me, when I first started going out to clubs, when I first, you know, was old enough to, to get in, and there's going to be older guys that listen to this and be like, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You know, you weren't there in the Marrakesh days, but you know, whatever. Like I know, I know in the, you know, early nineties, Long Island was just insane. But the, the club format, I think became kind of burnt out with this, you know, venues only playing, you know, big room, build up EDM on top of the fact that the prices just kept getting jacked up. And it just, I think it just became a little too formulaic, I think, I guess you could say. And people just didn't want, people just didn't want it anymore. Customers, patrons didn't, didn't just didn't want to go out to these places anymore, pay, you know, as as much as a few hundred dollars to get to get in 
just and you know just to get an experience that they could probably get at this bar in Bayshore that has a nice dance floor to it. Um, so I, I think I think that was one of the big things. The the format just got very tiresome. People were getting over the music, I think, and it just led to people just not wanting anything to do with it. And it just eliminate it just eliminated the concept of the nightclub, at least in central Suffolk and a good amount of Nassau. You think it's become very like luxurious and very friendly to the upper class? Is that it? Well, it definitely always was. Um, the, the, the concept of bottle service, you know, that's how many people, especially now, would, would want to go to a club where you have to pay $40 to have your car parked and you're going to have to tip that guy. And then you're going to, you, you know, especially, you know, if you don't have enough women with you, which let's be real, that's the name, that's the name of the game. You want good. You want good-looking women in your club, and everyone else is going to follow. If if you don't have that with you, you're going to maybe be allowed in, but they're going to charge you the you know five hundred dollars to get in because in order for you to be allowed to, to come in, you got to buy a bottle from them, and they're going to mark that bottle up like crazy because that's also the name of the game. Always has been. You know, I think people just got burnt out on that, and even if they let you in normally. You know, if they let you in, okay, pay fifty dollars to get in. You're already ninety dollars in the hole, and then you're going to go in and you're going to spend nine dollars on a Corona. It's it it, it kind of it, it just got taught. I think it just got people to burn out on on the concept, which I which I do think is a shame because it's you know I I never really had a bad experience. I enjoyed it. You know, it was you'd go there and the whole aesthetic, the huge dance floor, the lights, the you know the a lot of times, you know, maybe a world-renowned or amazing DJ that that's in there, you know, you might have an artist appearance. You know, it's. I always thought it was a cool. Th I always thought it was a cool thing. Definitely not a every night thing, because you know that's how you end up broke in a ditch somewhere. But you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's just it just really doesn't exist out here anymore. And it's and and it's a shame. You still every once in a while get some, um, you get someone that tries to really get it going again. But besides that, I really think the only people that are really pulling it off in 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 the not Hamptons area of Long Island is Monsoon in in Babylon. Big shout out to DJ Decoy, one of the uh, residents over there. They're probably the closest thing to a club that you could get. You know, my my Friday night residency in Patchogue, it's definitely the biggest place in in Patchogue as far as occupancy. I would never consider that a club. That's a bar. It's just a bar that people could dance at, you know? So when, when you talk about, you know, your, your stream of revenue, be it, you know, event production and DJ, like how has that been affected by COVID? Slaughtered. Um, it was, it, it completely decimated it. And to the, you know, to the point where, it's just at a complete halt right now. And uh, I, I remember the weekend before the quarantine really um, picked up steam, not picked up steam when it, until it just happened. Um, I DJed that weekend and I DJed in Patchogue on that Thursday at, uh, at my usual Friday spot. And then my Friday gig in, uh, in Setauket got canceled because they were trying to get, you know, they, they saw what was coming, I think, and just wanted to get out while they still could. So they canceled that. I, I, I was able to pick up a bar gig that night. Um, so I, I was fine. I, I actually ended up making more money that, that, that night. And then Saturday came, and I had to DJ in Port Jeff that night. That gig ended up happening, and it w went well. And then that Sunday... I got a call from the two major companies where I do my mo where I do my private events from, and they essentially told me, and they were like, "Yeah, w for the next three months, all our gigs canceled," and and that was all my private event revenue was just gone for that. And then, on top of that, one of those companies was the company that I am the warehouse manager for. I run I run the warehouse there, you know sending out the lights and the sound, the TVs, video walls, and stuff like that. 
you know, obviously because they're canceled for the next few months, which means there's no more work to be done in the warehouse anymore. So I'm not there either. either. So that decimated me on that. So then it was, you know, well, oh my God, this thing is really real. Cause we, cause weeks coming up to it. And I, and I feel like such a jackass because of it, the weeks leading up to the quarantine, I was definitely one of those people where it's like, oh yeah, but everyone was scared of H1N1. Everyone was scared of, you know, Zika and this and that, you know, we'll, 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 we'll be fine. And, and it just, uh, it definitely went to another level for that. And rightfully so. I, 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 I'm definitely not one of those people that thinks this is getting blown out of proportion. Um, but it just took over. So then that following Tuesday, St. Patrick's Day, I was supposed to DJ in Patchogue for their big, um, you know, St. Patrick's Day celebration. And that was when the hammer came down, when it was, you know, can't have more people than 50. Um, Got to do this, social distancing, all that stuff. And that's and so that Sunday and that Tuesday, that's when it became really real, where it's like, oh, no, like this, my source of income just went from pretty good to zero. <laughs> you know what's really funny? Like that Thursday that you were talking about, I was supposed to have DJ 631 on my little underground, but he was like smartly, wisely so, like, no, nah, man, I'm not trying to do, I'm not trying to catch anything. And I was like, yeah, it's over. Cause I had another interview that I was supposed to do that weekend and shut that down because of everything that's happening. But yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah and dude, like, the crazy I, thing, the crazy yeah. thing about that is, you know, like, like I said, I had all these, I, I DJed essentially a full weekend leading up to the quarantine. Every single gig was packed. Like it was as if nothing was happening. People were hugging people were this, you know, I was, you know, and major props to, to my girlfriend for really, you know, telling me to be careful and, and kind of drilling it into my head, you know, you know, try to distance yourself. You know, I, I set my gear up a little further than where I usually am, kind of got tucked away a little bit, um, you know, sanitized like crazy, wiped everything down, was, you know, sanitizing my hands like crazy. And, you know, who knows if that, you know, if I didn't do that, if it would have helped or not, you know, there's so much information out there saying yes or no, you know, it's, it's crazy. But, um, you know, I obviously was good from that weekend, but it was crazy to look at, like, there was, there really wasn't that much care or, or knowledge maybe that this was going to take the turn that it did because people were out, man. Like I, I, I filmed videos of it just like, dude, like these people don't care, you know? And, and I was still middle of the ground. Like, you know, obviously I care, but if things are still, you know, who knows if, if, they didn't shut stuff down. I probably still would have just kept working, you know, and and I don't know if that would have been the wise choice, you know, because, you know, I, I kind of fall into the, I definitely don't think I'm high risk, but I think I fall into the sort of, you know, higher than average risk because of, because, you know, I grew up with asthma. It hasn't bothered me in years, but apparently if you had asthma at any point, you know, that's, you know, you're, you're a bit of a higher risk people in my family are higher are higher risk so you know i'm kind of you try to find that silver lining so you know may you know maybe it's a good thing that it stopped me from working it sucks i'm not making any money but it's just part of the game at this point you must have saved a lot of money then um i mean i i definitely was i for these for these past few months i've been do been able to do okay um but you know it's definitely reaching that point where it's getting a little dicey and i i could definitely use uh you know things at least starting to get back to normal but you know who knows what at at this point i'm just taking it uh taking it as it goes you know i'm i'm paying attention a little bit i think it gets it gets kind of like overwhelming as far as like you know listening to listening to the, to the news and i'm kind of one of those people where i'll listen to multiple things of news i'm i'm, I'm a kind of middle of the ground guy so, you know, I, I'm not, I try not to, you know, just listen to this news outlet or just this news outlet, um, you know, but there's so much different information where I reach a point where sometimes I just got to detach and I'm just like, all right, did the, did the all clear horn sound yet? Okay, no. All right. I guess I'll be inside then. <laughs> that's kind of, that's, that, that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Just because even, you know, I'm a diehard podcast, podcast listener. 
there's been multiple times where like I've had to turn uh, podcast uh, podcast off because it's like, all right, dude, we're we're two hours in and we're still talking about COVID. Like this this is getting exhausting, you know. Like <laughs> so, it's it, it's really I've definitely come to a point where I I've detached a little bit out of I don't know I don't know if that's if that's uh, you, you know a bad a bad thing or not, but you know that's kind of just if I get overwhelmed with something, sometimes I need some some breathing room. No, I think that is actually the the healthy way of going about it. I mean, it's important to to to, to get information to to know what's going on. At least know like the the, the gravity of the situation. But you don't want to like unless you're a journalist and you kind of have to. Because I know people who work for the New York Times and they're just constantly in it, so they don't have the luxury to like ignore the news. But you know, I think for our mental health, we need to just kind of exhale and make sure we're okay before we like you know dive into what's happening with the world constantly. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, given all the, you know, the uncertainty economically that you've been going through, I mean, at least one good thing that came out of it is your, your creative mind to put together your, 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 your DJ set on the, on Twitch. And I personally think like guys like you should have been doing that a long time ago because Wow, it's it's just like the production value is great. And just yeah. walk me through like the beginnings of of you bringing your DJ skills to Twitch. Um, well, I I actually did try the first time I ever DJed on any type of online platform was probably around like two the like 2012 maybe, and that was when like UStream was still a thing, Justin TV was still a thing. Oh yeah, um, I think. Wow. Yeah, remember Justin.tv? I think I actually think some maybe pay per views illegally from that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I I actually think somehow they got absorbed. Maybe they got absorbed by Twitch or like there's there's something that happened with where Twitch has a good amount of like the old Justin TV because there's I typed in my name to see if anyone else had my name or whatever, and like the first thing that came up was a video, you know, DJ Caution on the WUSB Hip Hop Marathon 2012. You know, wow. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I don't know exactly what happened, but you know, that's it's it, it's out there. And oh god, I watched it; it was terrible. Um, but uh, they, uh, so I tried it back then, and you know, there really wasn't any, you know, va- production value to it. Not a lot of people were, were, you know, as as far as fans or any, or anything were really paying attention to it, unless you were someone who had a diehard following already. You know, if you were, you know, if if you were jazzy jeff and you did a you stream yeah a lot of people are going to watch it if you're just some dude that's still living at your parents house in farmingville like i was at the time like you know who the who the hell's gonna who the hell's gonna watch you play a fugazi record and then a jay dillo record like i don't like i don't like i don't know who's gonna watch that so i kind of just left it alone at that point it was fun but i I, but i left it alone and then some people started really to do the live thing again um Actually, a few years, you know, in the years leading up to where we're at now, and a few guys started on the Twitch thing. But on on Twitch, it really was, it was really the dance music world that was that was hopping on it, um, which was awesome. You know, I'm like I said, I'm a big I'm a big dance music fan, man. I, I'm I'm a big househead. Um, but you had guys like Diplo who were killing it on there, and then later on, um, you know, the the rest of the EDM world started started hopping onto that you know as far as the you know just the open format dj working dj it really was an untapped thing so when this started happening you know a a lot of guys like myself we we wanted a we wanted an outlet this wasn't really something to where you know i need to make money doing the doing something that has to do with djing it was really like dude like i haven't djed in like a week and it's like that builds up to like a void kind of um and from there it was okay well what can we do and big up to the guys at uh dj city and uh especially um their tips and tricks uh host mojax he launched a video a few years ago where it was kind of like a how to live stream 101 and a lot of people just went to that and was like okay like this is how this is how we could really do it and make it sound good you know make it to where you're not just putting your phone next to your speaker hoping that it somewhat sounds good which drives me nuts now and uh 
so a lot of guys took that video and, we t and other videos and other, t and other tutorials and looking what other guys were doing. And I was like, okay, well, we could do this. And it's relatively inexpensive. It, it definitely can add up and get expensive. Um, but you know, a lot of us, especially the working guys, we had at least enough equipment to get by in making our streams look professional. And it kind of just snowballed from there. And I think a, a one good thing, if there's anything good that came out of it, was we started to get a little creative again. Because DJing, you know, top 40 spots and um, and weddings and mitzvahs and stuff, they can get a little redundant and just like, all right, like, I got to play, you know, another loud luxury song, then followed by another Tyga song. No disrespect to those guys, fan of both of them. But, like, you know, you can only hear, you know, taste so many times before. It's just like, uh. So we started to, like, you know, what do I want to play? What, what weird scratch stuff do I want to do? Do I, you know, I have this tone play routine that I came up with that I know I can't do in a club, bar, or private event. Maybe I could do it on Twitch and people could appreciate it. And it kind of kind of sparked this creative juice guys were you know for me i was going deep into my r&b library just like i haven't played this song in forever i wonder if people will like this and it kind of started gaining traction and uh it really it really just opened up kind of opened up djing in in a sense like guys were really like i'm gonna do what i want now i'm still gonna try to please people you know a lot of us are still making you know taking requests and you know doing the shout outs and the stuff like that but you're adding more of the flair that you would be able to DJing out in public. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing like DJing in front of a crowd and hearing, you know, the inter the interaction. You, you drop a record that everyone loves and hearing that, oh, like there's nothing like that. Nothing will compare to that. But this is really, it's it's a different, it's a totally different lane. And it's something that someone like me who likes to be creative with playing other people's music because let's be real that's what i'm doing um but there is a way to be creative with it and that's that's the real important thing that a platform like twitch has brought to the table because you can do it on facebook you can do it on instagram but um you know unless you're unless you're d nice and you have michelle obama and you know a bunch of other celebrities watching your stream you're not going to last more than a half hour on those platforms because they're so tied into the system of copyrights and stuff like that with, you know, if, if their algorithm senses you playing a popular song, boom, you're, they're, they're shutting you down. And if they shut you down enough times, your account's going to get banned or at least suspended from using the live feature. Um, you know, we don't know how long Twitch is going to be able to survive doing the open format thing i know now um they're you know if you're playing a very popular song a copyrighted song if they sense it if their algorithm picks it up they'll mute it to like you know if you go back and you want to watch a past video that section will be muted but as far as in the moment live which is really the mo most important part you're pretty free to do do with what you want um I don't know how long that's going to last. Um, if it's going to last, I'm, you know, hopefully if, if Twitch is smart, and this is coming from someone who does not deal with the higher ups of the music world, um, if they're smart, you know, they will have their team just hauling ass to just figure out how to keep it to where it's at right now. Um, which I'm going to assume that there's, you know, some geniuses that are running that, that site that are definitely doing that. But it's it's just a great it's a great platform, and you could add um, other things to the to the production value. You know, if you've seen mine, you know I added overlays, I added logos. Um, you know, I was able to, you know, the screen, you know, the, the screen resolution is better to where you know I set up a little bit of a light show. I, you know, it's you could treat it as if it's a production. You know, like it's it's a real production. You know, I'm in my streaming my streaming room which is essential which was essentially just a spare bedroom in uh in my house that me and my girlfriend weren't using and i sat in here as like okay where what's the best way to angle this 
you know, let's do this. Let's set up up lights right here. Let's do, you know, let's set up a TV right here that can have my logo on it. It's, I'm in here every day trying to beef up what's, what's going on in here and, and, and make it better. Um, because now you want, I know DJing is 90% sound, but you kind of want that 10% looks to kind of catch people's eye, you know? So, and it's, it's a lot of fun and it's just a lot of, you're, you're interacting with your audience more. It's more fluid. Um, it's, it, it's just fun. It's just a lot of fun. Plus the little, the added bonus of it makes it kind of easy. And this is kind of a polarizing issue. It makes it easy for those people that want to be generous. You know, you could, you could potentially make some money doing this. You know, I don't know if anyone's making, you know, ninja video game level revenues, you know, which was what Twitch was originally designed for. Um, I don't know if anyone's making that type of money, but you know, it's, you could walk away making, you know, a little bit, a little bit of money worth for your time, which is, which is cool, which, you know, there's, a, there's some people out there that are very anti that. Um, I didn't know how to feel about it for a little while, but, uh, but it's, Hey man, if, if people, if people are giving, and this and and the site itself is uh, giving you revenue from their system, you know, why not? I guess at this point, you know. Yeah. How does how does it feel like to have your girlfriend like be almost like your your lighting director, and you guys are collaborating <laughs> to make something? You know what I mean to make your Twitch channel uh, special. You know, and what's it, like? What are some of the like? You know, um, like, are you, do you have a camera? Do you have an iPhone? Like, what are you using for um, your camera and stuff like that? Uh, well, well, first off, having having my girlfriend involved into it is such a blast, dude. Um, she she's not in the room for for all of them. You know, there's sometimes where I'll go pretty, like down tempo, and you know, I'm playing, you know, like some SWV tip stuff. Like, and you know, in all actuality, what are you going to really do with lights? As far as that, you're just going to put them on a fade and kind of you know just forget about it. Um, but uh, you know, I set up a very basic lighting controller that I had and. And, and two very powerful up lights and because anything else in this room and I'll be giving people seizures including myself but uh, you know and and I set it up and years and years and years ago me and her were at Firefly Music Festival and we were watching Anna Leno DJ and we were right next to the, uh, the front of house area and there was this girl who was working the lights and she was killing it on the lights and I remember Nicole looked at it and she was like wow that looks fun and i was like yeah i mean it's you if you take it serious enough and you get as technical as you can with it you're essentially djing just with lights now what we have set up in here is is very is unbelievably basic i'm you know that girl that was at firefly will look at this and laugh but as far as you know a webcam being faced towards me in a room in in a spare bedroom it's it's adding such a great amount of flair to it and you know we kind of just learned the tricks of the of this particular basic lighting controller together you know i learned and i you know i i would like to think i learned it a little quicker and then i showed her okay well this does that this does that if you wanted to do this hit these you know put this fader up put this fader down and then within two days i'm asking her how she did how she was doing stuff and she loves it i'm you know i'm glad that that she that she's involved to it. It's just an extra fun thing, it, you know. You know we're 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 stuck. We're we're in a house together, twenty four hours a day now. Because unfortunately, you know, her her work, her job is, you know, got sh got shut down before this too. And you know, this was a new this was a new thing for us to do. I think it brought us closer, and we were already freaking super close. Still are, obviously. And it's 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 just a lot of fun. You know, as far as the setup though, it's uh, as far as what we're using, um, it's really just two laptops. One is running my DJ software. One is running the streaming software, and then it's just a webcam uh, pointing at me. A, a, you know, a, a one of the higher end Logitech webcams um, plugged into a another laptop, which is running the streaming software slash editing software. I guess you could you could call it and. That's that's it, man. So uh, lastly, I don't want to keep you too long. What do you think is the the future of DJing from a live nightlife perspective? What is the future of it post COVID? Do you think? Ooh, um, 
it's it's tough to tell, man, because I it's definitely like if you look at it, I know a lot of the talk now is reopening stuff in fate is in phases. That's the, the the hot word right now, and it's all what's important. What's the order of importance with everything? And again, I, I'm not. I can't list what's in each phase for each state or whatever like that, but I'm going to assume that uh, entertainment in general is going to be in the the last phase of that. And even when it does open up, um, you know, how many people are going to feel comfortable enough to just, you know, on day one go, okay, we're, we're good. Let's go to the club where there's going to, let's go to the club or bar where there's going to be 500 people rubbing shoulders together. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. Um, I would like to be optimistic and, and think that, you know, at least here in New York, we are doing what we're supposed to be doing. And when the time comes for that phase to hit where we can, you know, kind of go back to, no to some sort of normalcy, that's even a word. Good job, Matt. Um, you know, like, that's, uh, I would like to think that we will have, gotten to the point where this isn't going to have a second or third wave and we can go back to normal you know um as far as how the djs are going to be after this i feel like and i've had this talk with a lot of my colleagues and, and i've heard this talk being had by other people i feel like we're kind of in like a reset you know as and I, yes and I think, exactly I, I agree i think i feel like entertainment is kind of in a reset in, in general, you know, um, you hear comedians, I'm a big comedian fan, I think there's a lot of parallels between working DJs and working comedians. Um, there's, you know, the people that that outlast this, that, that, that persevere through this, um, and are still and are still doing it, they'll, I think they're gonna come back in whatever way we're able to come back. I think they're gonna come back, the smart ones are gonna come back stronger. And also, specifically for DJing, I think it's gonna be the time where we really see who like, who the real people are that are gonna like lead the charge in the next one. I know that might sound dramatic, but like there really is in, in the working DJ scene, you know, 90% of the people or, or a good percentage of the people at the spot might not know who that DJ is, but it really is. There is a real big community of it. And I think we're really going to see like who the real ones are and who the real creative ones are. Cause are we really just going to go back and just, you know, do the same crap that we, that we were doing when we've been, when a lot of us have been on this platform, you know, really upping our skills and, and learning new things. You know, I, I, I hope that, there is a bit of a boost in in DJ creativity and and also people that are going out to hear the music. I, I'd like to think that we are kind of retraining the ear a little bit. You know what I mean? Like I've had I've had people, you know, I've played, you know, like I'd be doing I'll do an R and B set, and someone who's in there, you know, I'll play between the sheets, and someone who only knew that as being sampled in a Notorious B.I.G. record will be like, wait a minute, what's what's that, you know? And it's kind of, you know, I like to think we're, people are kind of being retrained again. I mean, the real fantasy is like we go back to the to the, to the DJ AM era and, 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 you know, where we could just play a Tears for Fears song in the middle of a hip hop set, you know, like that's, that's, that's the real dream. But, uh, but we'll, we'll see, man. I, I think it's going to be, I don't really know what it's going to be, but it's definitely going to be in interesting. All right, man. Caution. Thank you so much for being on My Little Underground. It's been a long time coming. Plug your Twitch, yeah, your Instagram, Twitter, whatever you're using. Um, well, the the main social media is uh, DJ Caution 631 Make sure you spell caution with a K because I was a hip-hop head growing up and everyone spelled stuff wrong. And then on Twitch, <laughs> that, yeah, come on, man. Everyone knows how nonfiction spelled their name. But, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, then on uh, on Twitch, that's twitch.tv slash caution631. Again, spell it with a K. And um, 
besides that, man, that's it, man. Dude, I real, I'm really glad we were able to make this happen. You know, sorry if I gave the most long-winded answers ever. I'm, I'm a DJ. We love to talk. <laughs> that's exactly why I brought you on. <laughs> awesome, man. Dude, it was great talking with you. Yeah, anytime. <laughs>